Good to see you. Uh, if I haven't met you before, my name is Nate, and glad that you're here. And we are in the last week of our series, Skeptic. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that are skeptical of the church, maybe skeptical of pastors, skeptical of Jesus. And we've, we've been looking at that and trying to help people like that. And you may be one of those people um, and answering some questions. And so we're going to do that again today. And not sure what brought you here this morning. Maybe you've been skeptical of Jesus for a long time, and then uh, Krispy Kreme opened up in Saco, Maine, and you're like, you know what? You know what? Maybe I was wrong about God. Maybe, maybe he is. Maybe he is a good God. And so you showed up this morning as part of your as part of your journey and as part of your travels on the way to Saco today. And, uh, we're finishing up the series today, and then next week. We're going to do uh, a few weeks leading into Halloween, uh, a series um, about fear, and uh, there's a few places in the Bible where Jesus and God said, fear not. And, uh, you know, there, there are lots of things that we can be, we can be afraid of, and, uh, and, um, and so we're going to just talk through that the next few weeks, so uh, it's a series that I've been wanting to do for a number of years, and so I'm glad we're going to take, I think, three weeks leading into Fall Fest and talk through that. So you want to be here for that, and it's going to be awesome. Well, when I was uh, when I was in college, I was it was Thanksgiving break. I owned a 1987 Nissan Sentra that my grandmother had given to me, and so it was it was Thanksgiving break, and uh, and so where I went to college in Rhode Island, I would pack my car up the night before. Uh, so I went to a college for people who were becoming pastors. So as soon as chapel got dismissed on that Thursday or it, on that Wednesday afternoon, I would leave. I would walk from the chapel to my car and leave. No, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't talk to anybody. Uh, I'm not taking, I'm not staying there an extra minute longer than I have to. So I'm ready. I'm pumped. I can't wait. Oh, I can't wait not to have to think about schoolwork and, and everything else. So I get in my car. I'm driving to my aunt's, and about 15 minutes down the road, my car dies right in the middle of 195, and I coast over to the side of the road. And I call a friend. I use their AAA. The tow truck driver shows up, and they've got 100 miles free uh, towing, so the tow truck driver dropped me and my car off at my aunt's house. And, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm going to be there for the weekend. We'll, we'll figure it out. Um, as we go along. Now, as I, I'm sitting in the cab of this tow truck talking to this guy, um, it's just a normal small, small talk. And so here's where I go to college. Oh, I've heard about that. I've heard about that school. And he's talking about the school. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be a pastor. He's like, oh, yeah. And he starts talking to me. And he says this. And maybe you've heard this before. Maybe you've said this before. He says to me, um, uh, and this is the first time I, I, first time I'd actually had someone say this to me, uh, you know, he's, and he, he's like, you know, I, I don't go to church because all the church wants is your money. And, and maybe you've heard this before, maybe you've said this before, and it was the first time I, I'd heard anybody say that, and I was shocked by it a little bit because certainly for me as a college student, um, my motivation for becoming a pastor was not to go into it for the money. Uh, if, I, if I was going to choose a career for the money, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go on a college career to become a CEO where the average salary, the average yearly salary for a CEO is $13.8 million a year. If I'm going to enter a career path for the money, I'm going to go toward that. And if I get assistant CEO or assistant to the CEO, certainly I'll be doing all right. And so that wasn't my motivation. My motivation was I was 14 years old and God changed my life. I was 15 years old uh, sitting on my dad's recliner eating Honey Nut Cheerios watching ESPN where I felt and all of a sudden had this daydream or, or vision that I was going to be a pastor doing exactly what I'm doing right now at 15 years old. And I thought, all right, let's do it. And that was my motivation in my life. So I was shocked, and I tried to answer the guy's questions. I'm like, well, you know, we give, but it's not, it's not about money. And he, and he just started telling me all these horror stories that they could have been made up. Who knows? I mean, I don't, I don't know the guy. And, 
And so I get out of the car that day, and I, I tried to encourage her. I'm like, well, listen, just think about Jesus and, and, and give it another shot. And then I went on my Thanksgiving break. I, I never saw the guy again. Who, who knows whatever happened to him. We'll assume he listens to my preaching every single week online. Like, we've made such an impact on him that he's, he's been following uh, Restoration Church for years. Now, this seems to be a, a common objection to Christianity. Because people are skeptical of Christianity, skeptical of church, because they think that everything we do and in, in, in any way that we help people or anything that we talk about is always this kind of backdoor or, or this scheme to get your money and to take your money. And honestly, there have been uh, shysters in the church throughout its history and even in Recent history. So just did a quick uh, Google search, uh, pastors stealing money, and um, there, there's a whole bunch that you can read of, but I wanted one that was recent. So a pastor in Dallas, Texas, was accused of stealing nearly $500,000 from his church. And so they're going, through, um, they're going through the courts right now trying to um, get him put in jail, trying to do a civil suit against him. These are... I mean, it's crazy and it's unbelievable and, um, and it's sad. And so it can seem, and, and maybe for this guy, it was legitimate that he was in it for the money. Certainly $500,000 is a lot of money. And if he is taking advantage of people and stealing from people, yeah, like that's, that's wrong and that's immoral and he should be put in jail. And, and kind of in the eternal perspective, um, you know, there is justice um, eventually for those people. We, we believe God is a God of justice, not just a God of, 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 of mercy. And um, even Jesus, when he was here on earth, a, a, experienced uh, some, of the, um, uh, some of the bad side of, uh, of people's motives. And there's a story in the Bible, or this, this account in the Bible, where this lady pours expensive pour perfume on the feet of Jesus. And one of the disciples, Jesus, uh, Judas, speaks up against this. And, he, and, and she's like, this is a waste of money. We could have used this money toward, um, toward helping poor people. And Jesus responded. I'm going to read this to you. Uh, this is out of the uh, Berean Study Bible. It says in John 12, 6, Judas did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to take from what was put into it. A lot of people don't know this, but the ministry Jesus had, there were, uh, there were uh, significant benefactors toward that ministry. There are a lot of people supplying, uh, uh, donating money toward his ministry that was allowing him to travel, allowing him to feed his disciples, uh, allowing them to to, uh, to cross the Sea of Galilee by, by ship. And so Judas was the treasurer for that ministry. He held the money bag and he, and he dispensed it. And not only did he dispense it for the ministry, but he was always kind of taking, um, taking a little bit off the top for himself. And Jesus knew this. Um, and he didn't ultimately confront it because he knew, he knew ultimately how all of it was going to plan, how all of it was going to play out just in his omniscience, in his all-knowing uh, and his all-knowing power. But Judas was doing this. He, in this story, he wasn't concerned about poor people. He wasn't concerned about this lady honoring Jesus. He was concerned about the money he was, he could have, he could have resold that, um, that perfume and begun to, and, and gained even more money for himself. Within the the title of Christianity within the title of church, there are people who don't care about the poor. There are pastors and leadership and church leadership who don't care about the poor, who don't care about the mission. Uh, and that's to share Jesus with people. There are people who will betray Jesus for just a little bit extra. That happens. And we're not going to deny that happens. We're not going to um, pretend it doesn't happen. Uh, our church has been around uh, 71 years, and 
um, and thankfully without scandal, without financial scandal over the years. Um, and we have precautions we put in place. So the person who um, the person who balances the checkbook is not the same person who puts the money in the bank. It's not the same person who signs the checks. There are three kind of areas that are separated, uh, and so one person can't fudge all the numbers to pocket themselves. Now, not everything is foolproof, but that's one precaution we put in place because we want we 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 want it to be about Jesus and um, and and not about scandal and not about um, uh, disaster and there was a there's an example in history that is in the bible uh, and a, a couple different places that begin to show us the difference and for those of you who are skeptical of why people give their money to the church or why we even talk about it i want to hopefully show you a little bit why like it goes way beyond your wallet or your purse and and it goes much deeper than that. So we could um, we could categorize ourselves as kind of in, in two different groups. And the first are the getters. These are people who are looking to acquire and accumulate. And Judas would be considered one of those people. It is, uh, I'm going to get things for myself. There's another guy in history uh, by the name of Solomon and he was the son of David. You may be familiar with David. He was the, the shepherd uh, boy who killed Goliath, who ultimately became king. And Solomon was the heir to the throne. In 1 Kings chapter 10 and then into chapter 11, it begins to talk about the wealth that Solomon had. Now, there's nothing wrong with wealth, but um, let's look at what he had. So his yearly income, it says in... First Kings chapter 10 was 25 tons of gold. Uh, that's his yearly income. That's what was coming in to him every year. That's about, that is 800 ounces of gold at today's price of $1,277.75 per, per ounce. That's a yearly income of $1,022,000,000. So significant income, significant wealth. Solomon as part of this, lived an extravagant lifestyle. And in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 21, we'll put this on the screen. It said, all of King Solomon's drinking cups were solid go gold, as, they, as were all of the utensils in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. So uh, his second palace also had all gold utensils. They were not made of silver, for silver was considered worthless in Solomon's day. Um, all of our drinking cups come from like McDonald's and, uh, and, the, and the clearance section at Walmart. But there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong per se with this wealth or with this extravagance, depending on where your heart is. And what we begin to see in Solomon's life is that his heart was in a, get, was in a position to get. He was, uh, his heart was motivating, motivated on getting things for himself. He was accumulating these things. And again, it's not wrong to have wealth and it's not wrong to have stuff. You've, many of you are wealthy. Many of you have stuff. That's not wrong. But eventually, as we'll begin to see, these things started to change his heart. He started as, many, he started as king, honored that God would choose him, or excuse me, uh, Solomon started as king and... Um, and, and with the right motive, when God said, hey, I can give you anything, what do you want? And Solomon said, I want wisdom. He didn't ask for stuff. He asked for wisdom because he truly wanted to lead God's people. He truly wanted to follow after his father and to continue the legacy and continue on with the heritage that his father had left. And he started at a great place, but he didn't continue there. We see this, that um, especially at the beginning of 1 Kings chapter 11. And if you get your Bible, we'll, we'll let you turn there. And if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one. It would be our honor to give you uh, your first physical copy of the Bible. Or if you don't have a copy of the Bible in like a modern uh, English uh, translation, we'd love to give you that. And then certainly you can download the Bible app on your phone and follow along with us there. 
In um, 1 Kings 11, I'm going to read this out of the English uh, Standard Version. Um, and uh, we'll start reading here at verse number 3. 1 Kings 11, verse number 3. He, being Solomon, had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart, for when Solomon was old, his wives turned away, turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. As Solomon begins accumulating things, one thing he accumulated was 700 wives and 300 concubines, and they led his heart from being at the place where he prayed for wisdom to going to the place where he was praying to other gods. His heart wasn't fully devoted. That's the big thing here when we talk about money within our church. And when I talk about money to you, it is a hard issue for us. And Solomon in his heart switched from from wanting to honor God to wanting to get and wanting to accumulate and wanting to, um, uh, uh, and wanting to keep his wives happy and, and compromising all over the place, disregarding what God said over and over and over again. As a pastor and a pastor of Restoration Church, I have a responsibility to help people follow Jesus. I have a responsibility to open the Bible every week and talk about the Bible. I have a responsibility before God for the things I teach every week, for the places I lead you. And, um, and it's not one that I want to take lightly. And I'm sure there's times I have. But it's not one I want to take lightly because there are places in Scripture that talk about if you're going to be in a place where you're teaching God's Word, you're going to be held to a higher standard than someone who's sitting under it. So... You may have been burned in a, in a church before, and you think, how could I have fallen for that? How could I, you know, and you think it'll never happen again. And, uh, and you, maybe you think God's disappointed in you because of where a pastor brought you. And I, I, I think certainly for some of the people in the Plymouth location, not the pastor um, that merged with us, but in the previous pastor before that 10 years ago, led them on some wild um, unbiblical beliefs, and some of the people f still feel guilty about that. But listen, God's not going to hold the, the parishioners to the same degree as he's going to hold that pastor who was just um, teaching them things that weren't in the scripture and leading them down a wrong path. But I have a responsibility. I can't water things down. I can't just ignore things. We've got to talk about things in here. And then, and then it's my privilege to see you take steps in your relationship with God and to see you begin to follow God in a way you never had before. And that's part of what I have to do. As a pastor, um, I want to lead you to have fully devoted hearts to God, not partially devoted. Now, I know you're skeptical of all of that too. And uh, you're like, well, that sounds nice, but this is all just part of your brainwashing technique or, or kind of wherever, wherever you are um, kind of in that. But I, for those of you who will hear me, to know that is why, we, why we're motivated to do things. That's why we hold people accountable. That's why, you, you know, if you're living outside of Scripture that I may invite you to a cup of coffee to talk about it. That's why I may push you to, to, to take a bigger step or, or um, you know, not to, uh, not to just be lazy in, in, in following him. Um, and when we talk about giving, I'm not talking about to people. When I talk about giving, I'm not uh, talking to people who aren't following Jesus, who haven't come to know Jesus yet. So when you think about the church, all it just wants is my money. Well, if you don't know Jesus, we don't want any of your money. That's not, our, our motivation isn't to get you to come to church here and to become giving. We want you to meet Jesus and then to follow Jesus. And this isn't something that we want to convince you of to give 
But for those of you who have had your life changed by Jesus, you're saying, all right, I'm trusting him for my forgiveness. I'm trusting him for my salvation. I'm trusting him to lead me step by step every day of my life. Giving, you're going to be confronted with that eventually in your life. There will come a point where God will speak to you about giving and generosity. And as your pastor, I'm helping to introduce that conversation to you. Say, hey, if you're following him, this is an area you follow him. And, um, and this is for the, the giving conversation is for those people who have already made the decision to follow you, to follow him. I want people who've never heard the message of Jesus, never made the decision to follow Jesus, not to hear us talking about money every week, but I want them to hear us talking about Jesus every week. And there are, because we're a mixed crowd of people who are following Jesus, people who are nominally following him, and they've kind of followed him one week and not really the next, and we have people who have never made a decision to follow Jesus. We, have to, we talk to all three groups of people every single Sunday. So we're introducing the people to Jesus, we're trying to get people back on track to following Jesus, and we're trying to encourage those who are following him to keep at it. And so giving is something we talk about for those people who are kind of in the middle of the spectrum and the end of the spectrum. They are following Jesus. And here at the beginning, never met Jesus. We want you to meet him first. We can have in our heart as people who follow Jesus, we can have a heart of, of, of being getters and accumulating things for ourselves where Jesus teaches and if we follow him, we would have hearts of, of generosity, that we would be givers. As Christians, we wouldn't be getters, but we would be givers. In contrast to Solomon, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 6, he talks about storing up treasures in heaven, not on earth where ro rust and moth can destroy things. You can store up for yourself treasure in heaven and then a flood can, uh, you can store up for yourself treasure on earth and then a flood can come and destroy it all. You can store up for yourself treasure on earth and then an earthquake can uh, collapse it all. You can store up for yourself treasure on earth and then a wildfire can burn it all. You can store up for yourself treasure on earth and then a hurricane can come and decimate it all. But there's something that ra rust, moth, Natural disaster can't take, and that's the treasure that those people who are following Jesus can store up for themselves in heaven. In Matthew chapter 6, 24, Jesus said this, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And every single one of us are kind of confronted with this. You're going to live your life devoted to God or you're going to live your life devoted to money. And so I hope you're beginning to see now why churches talk about money because we're trying to help people live lives devoted to God. And Jesus said that money is a huge part of that equation. That if you're trying to serve money, you're not going to be able to serve him. Let's think about it a different way, all right? Let's go back to Solomon. Solomon, 700 wives, 300 concubines. Answer me this, which one was he devoted to? Which one? Is this his first one? Or maybe his second one because the first one wasn't good enough, but the second one, she was the real one. Maybe it was the 700th wife or the first concubine. Which one is the one he was devoted to? Now, I only have one wife, <laughs> and a true story, and <laughs> she, and, and but, so I'm not speaking to this example, but, uh, or, or out of life experience, but I would assume it would be impossible to be devoted to one when you have 999 others. But just think about that. And, and so the most you could express is to say, you know what, I'm kind of devoted. As you 
make a decision, are you going to be, are you going to serve God or are you going to serve money? You think, well, I don't serve money. All right, maybe it's not titled money, but there's, there's 999 concubines in there that you're going to give and classify a different name. So whether that's golf or whether that's your car or whether that's sleeping in or whether that's your privacy, whatever you want to call it. If you think about money as a concubine, you can, it can have a bunch of different little names, but it's certainly, you begin to see like, oh, wait a minute, I am not devoted to God. Uh, a concubine uh, in ancient times was a female who voluntarily enslaved herself and uh, enslaved herself to a man primarily for his sexual pleasure. And there's a reason why they did this, because in the ancient time, and here in, the, in this biblical time, biblical times, unmarried women were completely dependent on their family members, um, such as their fathers or their brothers, to provide for them. They weren't able to uh, get jobs. Uh, many of them weren't able to get education. And so if for some reason a woman had no family, or if her husband died or divorced her, she would be left with very few options for survival. And so becoming a concubine would be one way they could provide for themselves and provide care for themselves without uh, becoming a prostitute or without becoming homeless or without experiencing death through starvation or disease or some other way. So a concubine, as she's kind of enslaving herself or giving herself to this guy, it was her way to say, all right, well, I have basic human needs that I need to meet. And so if I'm one of a thousand, then, uh, you know, then certainly that is better than, um, than being a prostitute and, and, and being homeless. So if you think about this and, and, and think about money as a concubine, all right, what money is going to do is it's going to enslave itself to you a promising pleasure. And so you just begin to think, um, oh, this is, I have more and more, I have everything I need, this is so good, life is so fun. And you could even begin to convince yourself that you're doing a good thing. As uh, Judas tried to do when he's saying, hey, that perfume is expensive, we could, you know, I, I'm concerned for poor people, you know, I could have more money, we can really begin to help people. Or Solomon uh, you know, Solomon had concubines. David, his father, had concubines as well. And the Bible doesn't specifically speak against it, uh, but certainly the Bible doesn't endorse it either. So why is it in here? Uh, how could these guys who are trying to follow God have all these wives and all these concubines? Well, what I believe they did is they tried to convince themselves they were doing something good. Oh, here's all these poor, hot girls. Um, I will... I will care for them, I'll feed them, I'll give them a nice place to live, and I'm doing them a service. I am, I am, I am helping the poor. And, uh, and we, we, we don't think that's right. We don't think that that was endorsed by God, but we can begin to see how these guys convince themselves they, do, they were doing a good thing, but they weren't. They were accumulating. They were, again, they were getting. It is about me. It is about my pleasure. It is about my life. Money, it, it's a little bit different in that you think you have it under control. You think it is a servant of you. But if you have and moved into a getting heart, you have actually enslaved yourself to it. If I'm going to go back in time and talk to that tow truck driver. My conversations to him is going to be different. We as followers of Jesus, we want to be givers. No one's tricked us. No one's taken advantage of us. Jesus has changed our life. And so we want to give. We as followers of Jesus, not only do we want to be givers, but we can see in Scripture we need to be givers. 
Because even if we start out with a motive, God, give me wisdom that I could lead your people well. If we don't keep cultivating that in our life, there comes a time, and I don't think we know it when it happens, but we will eventually find ourselves where we are getters and our heart is not fully devoted to the Lord. Now, we don't give out of a motivation to prove to Jesus that we're legitimate. So we're not giving to prove ourselves to him. And we're not giving to make sure that he stays our Lord. So it's just not, we're not trying to appease him or take our money, stay happy with us. This is not King Louis from the Jungle Book here. <laughs> you know, this is not, this is a wrong perception of the Lord, if you guys want to come up. This is a wrong perception of the Lord, a wrong perception of who he is and how he interacts with us. He loves us. He cares about us. He's given his life for us. We've experienced that. We love him as well. And we give because he's commanded us to. We give because we want to and we give cheerfully and not out of reluctance. And we give because we need to because we just want to stay devoted to him for the rest of our life. And we don't want our heart at some point to switch from being a, from being a giver to being a getter. Think about it this way. Um, you know, I, 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 I go on dates with my wife to stay devoted to her. Not because, I, you, you know, not because I'm trying to prove to her that I love her, not because I'm trying to just make sure I keep her happy so she doesn't leave me for someone else. I don't date my wife so I can um, t t convince her or control her. One of the main reasons for me that I, that I go on dates with my wife is so I can make sure I keep my heart devoted to her. It's not about making her happy or getting her off my back. It's so I can keep my heart devoted to her. Because I know very quickly, my heart can go from being a giver to being a getter. And it begins, it begins to work its way through my thoughts. Like, what has she done for me? What does she do to serve me? What is, but but as, I, as I date her, it just helps me keep my heart where it needs to be. And certainly there's a benefit for her and certainly we have fun and, and, um, and certainly we fought on dates before. So, you know, we don't have the, the most um, perfect marriage. But keep, it keeps our heart devoted. And our giving is because of our love for him. We give because we want to keep our hearts devoted to him and we give really truly because we love him. It's not an obligation to stay devoted to someone you love. It's a blessing. Dates when you love each other are a great thing. And it spurs you on toward deeper love and toward greater love. So the church, why do we talk about money? There's, there's a lot of reasons, but what we, what we talked about today is we want to keep our hearts devoted to him. As a pastor, I want to help to lead you into everything that God has for you. Those of you who are making, you've made a decision to follow Jesus, I want to help you to fully follow him, to have a heart fully devoted to him. And for those of you who, you don't know Jesus, what I want you to see from the people in this room is that, well, all right, they must, he must have done something legitimately in their life. They must really love him if they're giving. And for you to move from being skeptical to being hopeful, 
all right, maybe these, if these people aren't brainwashed, if the church isn't just about their money, if they're not giving to appease God, but they're giving because they love him, then you move to being hopeful. Maybe he is real. Maybe he can really help me. Maybe he would really forgive me. Maybe I can learn how to love him too. And you begin from thinking this as an obstacle to begin to, to see it now as something people aren't doing blindly, but because they've come to know the Lord, they've come to know Jesus. And if they aren't, if the church isn't trying, if the church isn't trying to swindle me, maybe Jesus can really forgive me. And so, hopefully, we've moved you just a little bit on that. And you can begin now to start to find Jesus. Why don't you close your eyes? I want to, we're going to, um, I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing for just a minute to give you an opportunity to just, re just talk to God about what he's talking to you about. Let's pray. Jesus, maybe we're confronted right now. Those of us who've made a decision to follow you, maybe we've been confronted with something in our life. It can be a little bit uncomfortable, but to realize, you know what? I, in my heart, I've moved to being a getter. And I just pray, man, you forgive us for that. Every single one of us, so quickly, we can move into that place. Just forgive us of that. God, we, maybe we're going to recognize, you know what, we, we haven't had a heart fully devoted to you. We haven't been, we haven't had a heart of, of, of giving and a heart of generosity. But that's not signing our bank, a check, bank accounts over to the church. It's not foolishness we're talking about, but just in our heart, God, that with wisdom and with generosity, we provide for our homes and our households, but yet we take steps of faith and, and live and follow your word. God, help us to be generous and to be givers. Lord, for those who are here this morning and money was one of the reasons they wouldn't consider you, I just pray right now to talk to you. And they would open their hearts up to you. Say, you know what? All right, if it's not about money, if it's, if it's about you, and I want to know you, Jesus. And that people in this room, even right now, would make a decision to follow you. And they'd pray a prayer, Jesus, I give my life to you. I ask you to forgive my sin and to be Lord of my life and to help me, help me follow you. I pray that prayer that you change their heart and change their life and forgive them and bring them on this great life that's knowing and following you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing. You're welcome to sit and reflect, to write, to take notes in your Bible, to stand and worship. But let's just take, let's take a, a, a minute here and, and uh, allow God to keep working in our hearts.